Mark's Gospel and chapter 4. We're reading from the verse 35. Well-known scriptures, but maybe we're going to hit it from an angle that maybe you don't uh, hear preached so often. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. Now some people say that that statement, even as he was, is indicating his physical state. Because if you would have followed him for the day before that, uh, you'd have been in a poor physical state too. Uh, we know that as he hit the boat, he fell asleep. Even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship. So that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Just stop a wee minute there. The fact that uh, he was asleep should have been a comfort to them. Well, they'd seen him working in the days before this and they knew that he was a miracle worker. And the fact that he was sleeping in this mighty storm should have been a source of comfort to them that he wasn't concerned. If he'd have been up with them, uh, stepping up and down the deck of the boat, wringing his hands and saying, this is terrible, what are we going to do? They might have had a cause for alarm. But the fact that he was asleep in this mighty storm should have indicated to them that there was no need to fear. And of course, we have no need to fear this morning. And he might think at times that he's asleep. But uh, he knows when to wake him. And he knows when to, when to speak. Verse 39, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now these next two verses, watch, there's two types of fear, and there are two different words altogether for them, and they have two different means. And he said unto them, <clears throat> Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Now here's the second one. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And we know that God will bless to us the public reading of his own precious word. Our text and our title are the same this morning. Found at the end of the 36th verse 
of this fourth chapter of Mark. And here it is. And there were also with him other little ships. So if you want to put a title on the message this morning, just title it, Other Little Ships. You see, so often when we read about this miracle, and we see what happened in the boat, and we see the Savior asleep, and the drama of the fear, we miss the other little ships. Remember that there was a flotilla of other little craft, and they too were following him, because that's what our text says. And they were also with him, other little ships. Now, it's only proper and right that we should, and of course we should, keep our eye always where Christ is. And when the storms of life are raging, and all around us seem to be dark, we need to focus our gaze upon him and cry to him and call unto him and always make him the center of attraction. But the Holy Spirit did not include this phrase for nothing. The Holy Ghost and the penning of the Word of God through men did this for a reason. And I so often tell you people here, when you're reading the Scriptures, you need to watch the detail of the little words and the little phrases. This was not put in for fun. This was put in for our learning. Mark just didn't think that I'll add this to it. It'll put a wee bit of color to this scene on the Galilee. Not a bit of him. For Jesus himself said that every jot and tittle is inspired in the Word of God. And you know what a jot is, you know what a dot is, and a tittle. So there's nothing meaningless in God's Word. Now, the question that we need to ask, and I have this message in my heart long before last night, the question that we need to ask this morning, what does the Lord want to say to us about these smaller ships that are following Him? What does He want to say to us about those that are following the captain and the crew of the big ship to the other side of the lake. And remember, that's where they're going. They're going to the other side. Jesus says, let us pass over to the other side. He didn't say we're going half ways and we're going to sink in the storm. He didn't say we're going to half ways and we're going to take fear and we're going to turn back. No, he says, we're going to the other side. And that not meant only the big ship, it meant the wee ships, the whole jing bang of them are going to the other side. So you need to get that into your, in, 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 into your head. Now, who were in these other ships, we don't know. How many other little ships there were, we don't know. There could have been three or there could have been 30. There could have been farmers in them, nurses in them, children in them, joiners in them. I don't know who was in them. But I know this. I know this. Because their boats were smaller, the storm could have hit them worse. Now, if this big ship that they were sailing in with the Lord, if it was full, and it says that it filled with water, and if these, if these uh, uh, 
seafaring fishermen who played the Galilee all their life and knew every inch of it, if these boys were at an end of themselves in fear, what were the other ones not like? Now, I'm trying to get something over to you this morning. I want to get something imprinted upon your mind this morning. If these people were hysterical and this larger boat was full, what about the little craft? And can I quickly say this first of all this morning? You're not the only one that's facing the storms of life. We are not the only ones that's facing the storm. And whatever your position or condition is this morning, you're not the only one that's in the teeth of the gale. Because I can tell you there's a gale blowing unprecedented against God's people. You know, some of us are no better than the disciples because when their boat and the ship that they were in started to rock and the water coming in and the panic and the cry, here's what they cried, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now, they weren't concerned about the other ones. We. You see, we're very introverted, are we not? with our own wee problems and sicknesses. If they went up onto the deck and they'd have got to look over and saw all those other little ships battling in the storm, it would have fitted them better, maybe. You're not the only one this morning, nor am I the only one this morning that's bearing the force of the gale. You may not be the only one this morning under the juniper tree. Carest thou not that we perish? You know, you think they hear some of us that nobody had seasickness like us. Maybe you're listening to me this morning or, or you're watching me this morning and there's a financial storm shaking your ship. And God only knows who that phrase is for because we're so proud. We would never admit to it. Maybe your income has been cut back. Maybe a few deals have gone wrong. Maybe the wife has overspent, benefits dried up, but always remember there are other little ships. And they're feeling it far worse than you are. You have never been without food for your children. You've never been without clothes for them to go to school. You've never come up to the supermarket till and not hadn't the money to pay for it. There are other little ships on this sea as well. And it would do us good to think about them. And maybe you're not far away from some this morning. Your children never went to bed hungry. But there are other little ships. There's other little ships following the Lord this morning too, you know. And nobody cares much about them. Can I give a wee word just in passing to youngsters this morning, you young people, teenagers and down? You just appreciate this morning 
what your parents do for you. Because mind you, there's some parents on the scrape and scrape to get, a, get clothes for you and to get education for you. And you just would need a wee bit of more manners towards them. That's just putting it as blunt as I can put it. I was sitting up in the we study there after I moved in here over 20 years ago. And I was sitting in the study and I seen this traffic police car coming up over the grill. And I looked out and I says, what have I done now? All sorts of boys drove up to me in the early days, but I had to chase them. There was a fella came up to me one, one, one day and he was driving a big black shiny hearse. And he pulled up outside the front of the house and he come in. He used to come about here. He says, I come in for a bit of a chat. I says, there'll be no chat. Get you that thing off the street. <laughs> or this place will be full before the night. And so he opened the door of the police car and I seen this, the stripes, I saw the sergeant getting out and hadn't seen him for a few years. And he came round the back and he got in and he says, Bertie, he says, I want you to pray. I worked with this fella, lived beside him, knew him for years. Oh, he says, we're in terrible trouble with the family. He says, I watch them. And he named them. He says, the money we spent on that fella. And he says, over eight months ago, he tore out of the house and we, don't, we didn't know where he was. No word over Christmas, no nothing. He said, we found out where he was, I'll not say where he was, but he was in a European country. And he says, me, and he named the wife, he says, we went, we went out, he says, and we found out where he was, and we knew where, the place that he was in. It was a summer's day, and we were waiting on the doors to open for all these people to come out, and the mother spotted him come. And the, he says we went over to him. And both of us moved over towards him and asked him, would he come home? And he turned on them in the middle of the street and what he said to them, I can't repeat. And they came home broken hearted. And can I say they were godly people. So you just have a wee respect, bit of respect for your family. Because some of them scrape hard for you. And then there are others, of course, and when the timbers are creaking and the old boat is rocking, uh, they call out about the, the physical complaint. But can I tell you this morning, there are other little ships too. And there are those this morning, and God bless you, you've been diagnosed with cancer and MS and ME and all the rest of it. And God bless you. But there are other little ships. Maybe it's not as serious as that. Maybe it's rheumatism. Maybe it's arthritis. Maybe it's lumbago. Maybe, maybe you sneeze six times in a half an hour. Well, there are other little ships. And there are other people bearing the burden and the brunt of physical pain and suffering too. You're not the only one. And you think to hear some of God's people that they wear. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the chief physician to the Queen, 
Queen's gynecologist. And of course, you know that he left the medical profession and he became the preacher, the great preacher of Westminster Chapel. And I'm quoting what Martin Lloyd-Jones says. I'm not saying this for I have no experience of it, but I'm quoting what he says as a surgeon and then as a pastor. He says, if there's a man in a room and someone goes into him and he says to him, you don't look well. And then that man comes out and in 10 or 15 minutes, another man goes in and he says, you know, you're very pale looking today. And then he says, that man goes out and he says, someone else comes in and, and, and says to him in the space of an hour or so, he says, do you feel all right? He says, that boy will become sick. He says, he'll get it into his mind that he's sick. You see, there's a lot of people bordering, well, there's some people on the border on hypochondriasm, if there's such a word that I'll use as anyway. But there are other little ships, you know. There are other little ships in the storm. And maybe suffering far more than you and I suffer, and they never open their mouth about it. Other little ships in the financial stress. There's other little ships in the physical stress. And oh, I tell you, when the boat rocks and the storm rages, financially and physically, it can hit domestically too. It can, it can hit the home. And you may think you have problems in your home this morning, but there are other little ships. And there are other homes, and they have far more trouble than you and I ever will have. Maybe there's a gale, maybe there's a cyclone this morning. Maybe it's gone on and on. Maybe it's to do with your wife. Maybe it's to do with your husband. Maybe it's to do with your children. Maybe it's to do with the parents. Maybe it's to do with the in-laws. I don't know. But I can tell you this. When you try to stay close, and I believe that these wee ships were following him, and I, well, it says it in the Word, and I believe that they were getting as close to him as they could, and, and I believe they were heading to the other side. And there's a whole lot of things we could say about them. They may not have been as close as the ones that were in the ship. They may not have seen what they've seen. But nevertheless, they're here, and nevertheless, they're making an effort, and nevertheless, they're hitting the storm. But you make sure this, my friend, that all the little families, every one of them will be cracked by the devil if you want to serve the Lord. And don't you be thinking now that you'll be doing anything to advance the kingdom of God and it'll be let go easy by the devil because it'll not. And you know that. And if you're not getting hammered from pillar to post in these, some of these areas by the devil, then you just question, are you in the battle at all? Because this is a battle. Now, I want you to listen carefully. Not that you're not, but I want you to listen carefully to what I'm going to say now. When the Lord Jesus Christ took his head off that pillow and he got up, at the cry of these disciples, and he calmed the stormy sea. It says, now you need to read all the gospel writers regarding this incident, but it says, it says that he rebuked the wind and the sea. He rebuked. Now that word rebuked is the word muzzle. 
And there's three times that it's used, and that, that Jesus used it, and the three times that he used it, it had to do with demons or the devil. Now take your time. Because I'm going to prove to you this morning that this was the devil that cast the storm across the Galilee. And don't you dare say to me that he hasn't the power to do it. He has the power to do it. If you know your Bible at all, in the book of Job in particular. Do you remember when they, when they come out of the synagogue, the Lord Jesus and Peter and James and John and them, they come out of the synagogue early one day and they came to Peter's wife's mother and Peter's wife's mother was dying with Luke, who was a physician, says, a great fever. And the Lord Jesus came into the house and he rebuked the fever. That's the word, rebuked. He muzzled the fever. It was the devil. It was the enemy. It was the enemy attacking the mother. And he'll attack the mother. And he'll certainly attack the mothers that's ministering. Because he healed her and she got up and ministered unto them. He doesn't like godly mothers. Do you remember when they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration that the father brought the boy that was possessed with the demons? Remember he was frothing at the mouth and he was roaring and he was crying and he was mad and he was firing and throwing himself into the fire? And the disciples tried to handle him and they couldn't handle him. He couldn't do anything with him. And Jesus and Peter and James and John had just come down from the glory, from the mountain of transfiguration. I tell you, you'll not be long coming down from the glory you've seen until you'll hit the devil. And he had took hold of this young fellow and he was wrecking him and destroying him as he's doing with lives of hundreds and thousands today. He was riding, of course, he's not being blamed for it. They're blaming everything else for it. But the devil's very real in young lives. And he was casting himself in the fire. And the nearer that he came to Jesus for healing, the worse he got. He kept throwing him. He, the devil kept hammer. He hammered him more and more the closer he got to the Lord because he knew he was going to lose him. And the Lord used that word again. He rebuked the enemy that was in him. I tell you, that father was in the storm. That father knew what it was to be battered in the gale. Probably his wife dead, trying to handle a fellow like that. And just with one word, he muzzled, he muzzled the devil. And that's what he did on the Galilee. He, he muzzled the storm. Just like that. Someone was saying to me this morning, I think we'd need to start praying more. I think we would. I think we'd need to start interceding more for families. Don't tell me that the enemy doesn't attack the home. Don't tell me that he doesn't attack the children and the family. And listen, and let me not go far away from my text because we are not, and you are not, the only one this morning. That big police sergeant with his legs stretched out up in that study that day and the tears in his eyes. Nobody would have known what was going on in that man's heart. But I'll tell you this, there are other little ships... You see, the problem is, as I come to a close, the problem was this, that the disciples allowed the storm to drive fear into them. Because in their minds, I would have known well what was going on in their mind. He told them that all was lost. He told them that there was no hope. 
He told them that they were all going to the bottom. And they cast out the word that he told them were going on to the other side. They had forgot all about that. He's asleep and he doesn't care. Carest thou not. How many times have you prayed? How many times have you cried to the Lord? How many times have you come to the Lord? And the heavens are like brass. He'll not waken at your whims, you know. He has a spot on time. And he has a time especially in order that he will be glorified through it. Because you know, you know, the longer they were in the storm, the more they appreciated the calm and the blessing and the victory. Oh, yes. There's two kinds of fear. They feared because of the storm. They feared because they were going to go down. How could they go down when Christ was with them? How could they die when the Prince of Life was with them? It was impossible for any boat on the Galilee to sink. He's not a bit concerned about that storm. It's nothing to him. He that created the wind and the waves and give on to the seas a decree. He can calm a wee storm on a lake like Galilee. And whenever the storm's raging in your life tonight, uh, uh, this morning, and I haven't maybe touched it in any of my application, but away down deep in your heart, there's a raging, there's a storm. I tell you this, you need peace. The devil can only go so far. And that fear, that word fear, the, the fear of the storm, it, it's translated by some as cowardly fear. They became cowards. I hope we haven't become cowards in the battle but that were soldiers that are going to go on. And the other fear is they feared exceedingly when they saw what he had done. That's a reverential fear, the fear of God. And sometimes he has to bring the fear into us in order to put the fear of God into us. Do you see what I'm saying? Sometimes he has to throw that gale across your life, my dear friend, this morning. And my life in order to get us to realize who he is because it was what he did. Now listen in closing. It was what he did. Calm in the storm, muzzling the storm and a great calm. Oh, it wasn't just left with a wee ripple on it. I tell you when he does something he does it well. Can you imagine I tell you, all the other little ships benefited from it too, you know. <laughs> they all benefited from it. You see, everybody will benefit when the Lord's working. When the Lord's working in a house, I tell you, if the Lord began to move in this place, I tell you, they'll benefit from it out past. They all benefited from it. But do you know what it did when he calmed the storm, when they saw the great calm? Here's what it did, and here's what he wanted it to do. They began to query who he was. What manner of man is this? Aye. They began to investigate now who he was. What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. And of course, I could preach another message just there. Now, he's the divine man. I tell you this. It's only God could calm the storm. He was a human man. God doesn't sleep. <coughs> he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. What manner of man is this? They began to question and inquire and query. That's what he wanted. And that's what he wants you to do this morning. Think of him. Think of his glory. Think of his power. Think of his might. 
He's not concerned what the devil's going to do. He has it all sorted out. And in closing, again I say, remember he's interested in the other little ships. This crowd in the big ship mightn't have been as close, might, be, might have been closer to him than the others were. And I want to say this very carefully this morning, but it needs to be said. I don't know who were in these other little ships, but I know that they were following him. They were following him. And they were heading to the other side. Now there are other little ships out there this morning and they're heading home to glory. And they may not believe what you and I believe. All right. They not, may not come round this table this morning. They may not go down into that tank ever. They may not hold the King James Version as the best. They may not wear a head covering. And they may not wear a tie. But they're heading home. Whether you like it or not, they're going home. And they're not without their storms either. They're not without their storms either. But he'll make sure they get home. After that. That's their business. And there were other little (coughs) ships. When I was in Victoria Island, maybe 8,000 miles away from here, I went to a big church on Sunday morning with maybe four or five hundred. I couldn't tell you how many was in it. But I came out of it. God bless them. And on the Monday night, my brother, who could only walk bits and had to go home on the bus at times, and a good bit of the time I was on my own. Monday evening, I went for a walk, way down around the harbour and way lovely, lovely part of the country, way round and up, up a side street, and I saw this wee shack of a build. And was on the outside of the church of the redeemed. And I looked out through the window and there was, I counted two black women and three white women and two men. I think there was five. And one woman was standing up and she had her hands up like this and I looked in through the window. So I didn't know what was going on and I went to walk on and they saw me and they come to the door and they says, come on in. She says, we're having a prayer meeting. And I says, I'm here in holidays, and I says, I just was interested. She says, you're very welcome to come in. So I come in, and this woman opened, and believe it or not, she opened the King James Bible after they were praying for a while, and she turned to the Scriptures. She says, here's what the Lord says for Victoria Island. I will pour waters on him that is thirsty. I will come down 
like the dew upon the mown grass. And then they went in to pray again, Lord, you promised to revive us. Lord, you promised that you'd pour your Spirit out upon us. And then one of these women got down on her knees and she got her head down like Elijah. And she started to cry to God. Now this was, this was a Monday night. On the sign it said that their prayer meeting was on Thursday night. But that a half a dozen of them or some had come together to pray. And they'd been coming together with a burden for prayer. And my spirit never witnessed on the Sunday morning, but I tell you, I had a witness of the Spirit of God in that wee place. The tears. And then they said, we'll all form round in a circle. So we formed round in a circle. And they said, tell us what you want to pray for. I said, I have a brother. Told him. And I said, I got a text this morning from a wee girl. From her mother. I got a text from her mother from Ireland. And she's not well. And one of the women looked at another man. She says, you pray for, you pray for Jack and you pray for Anna. What are you going to pray for? You pray for this. Boy, it was the nearest thing to heaven. And I looked at my watch. It was 8 o'clock p.m., 4 in the morning here. And when the people in Ireland were sleeping, there was people in Victoria praying. And God has other little ships. We are not the only one crying for revival. So this morning, maybe some of you here this morning and you're not as close to him as you'd like to be. You're not as close to him as Peter, James and John was in the ship. But then Judas was there too, remember. And so was Doubting Thomas. And so was Peter who was going to, who, who was going to forsake him. You may not have seen what they saw. But you're his child this morning. You're his child. And don't let the devil rob you from that. Because we're all going, if we're redeemed, to the other side. Let us pray. Now, Father, just let us sink into our hearts what we have heard this morning from your word and, Lord, whatever. Whatever, Lord, is of man or self or flesh, take it away, Lord. But let those good things settle in our hearts and minds. And help us to appreciate what we have. And help us, Lord, not to look down on others. Whatever, Lord, you say to us this morning, let us not rebel against it.
And so we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, and we thank you for help given. We thank you for your people. Lord, there's ones here this morning, and they're not very old. And maybe they're not able to do the things that others do. Maybe they're not as bright as others are. Maybe they're unemployed. I don't know. But Lord, you love each one of us this morning. And just because we seem to be out front or seem to be maybe closer to the Lord, maybe far further away from him than those that are on the, on the sea. Oh God, we'll get some awakening when we go to heaven. So I pray this morning, Lord, that you'll help us and you'll minister right into hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.